Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at the game that I played against Richard Rapport today in the first round of the semifinals of the FIDE Grand Prix here in Berlin. Now, as you guys know, I won my group and qualified for the semifinals, and now it's a match format as opposed to a group stage. So therefore, I play a two-game match against Richard, and Levon is playing a two-game match against Lenier. So without further ado, let's jump right into the game. So the game starts with d4, knight to f6, c4, Richard plays e6, I play knight c3, and now he goes d5. Now, again, as a lot of people know, Richard plays many different openings, and therefore what I try to do before the game is just do a little bit of general prep across the board against all sorts of different setups. Having said that, this was not something that I had looked at very closely. So I trade it on d5, I go bishop g5, Richard plays c6, I go queen c2. Again, a little bit unusual, white can also play e3, but in this specific move order, now black can go bishop f5 and prevent white from putting the bishop on this nice diagonal. Again, when you see the queen's game decline, normally the, the way that it occurs is something like d5, knight c3, bishop e7. And now after takes bishop g5, again, black can play c6 and white has moves like queen c2. So there are many different orders you can get this from, but it occurs from this one. So I go queen c2 here and he plays bishop e7, play e3. Again, idea to put the bishop on this nice d3 square and have it on this nice diagonal. And now we get knight bd7. I play bishop to d3 and Richard goes knight h5. Now... I was not necessarily expecting this opening, but I did have some idea that this was going to happen after he played bishop e7, and my first thought was, well, you know, I did have this way back in 2017 in the United States Chess Championship against Alexander Onishuk, one of my worst US Championships, by the way, I did lose that game with the white pieces. So we trade on e7, I castle, knight to b6, I go h3, g6, knight to f3. Now again, I wasn't 100% sure of the exact move or in, the, in that game against Alexander, but I did know we were very close to it. Now here Richard deviated, he played knight g7. In my game against Onishuk, bishop e6 was played, I played king b1, castles, and again, I could have transposed the game with something like g4, knight g7, knight e2, but in that game against Alexander, I went for the slightly... I wouldn't say dubious, but not as accurate plan of knight d2 with the idea of putting my knight on c5 instead of putting this knight on f4. So it's basically a game of horses, and I chose to use the other horse in the game today. Again, knight d2, knight g7 was played. I played g4, king b8, knight b3, h, h5 was played here, f3, bishop c8, queen f2, trade, and knight e6. Again, position is relatively balanced, maybe a small advantage for white, um, but nothing special. And as you can see, black gets h5 in. So in the game, after knight g7, I played g4. Again, very logical. Black would love to exchange his bad bishop on c8 for my great bishop on d3. A very nice wooden shield. So I played g4 to prevent that. Bishop e6. And now I go knight e2 rather than knight d2. Again, after knight e2, there are always are ideas with h5 here, like in that ownership game. So here I go knight to e2, castles, and I play king b1. The idea is that I want to put the knight on f4 and try to prevent this, this kingside expansion by black here. Additionally, up to this point, apparently this was played in a game in the uh, US, USSR Championship in 1988 between none other than Gary Chess, also known as Gary Kasparov, and Vasily Smyslov, the another former world chess champion. Now, I did not actually realize that during the game, but I, I think somehow vaguely in my memory, I recall looking at one of Gary's files from the time period when I was working with him, and I do vaguely recall in this Carlsbad setup putting a knight on f4. So whether it was specifically a file related to that game or not, I don't remember. But at any rate, it was something that I was vaguely familiar with. So here Castle is played, and now I played King to b1. Worth noting in that game that I mentioned between Gary and Vasily, Knight f4 was what happened. King to b8, Bishop e2, Knight to e8, Knight to d2, Knight d6, h4, Bishop c8. Knight to b3 trying to put on put the knight on c5, but after knight, f, knight e4, bishop f3, f5, black is completely fine here. He's got a really nice pyramid in the center of the board. Really, really compact. And in this position, Gary actually with the white pieces took a draw against Vasily. Now again, we think of Gary Kasparov and we don't think of him as being like Anish Girin making draws. But even, even in his career, he did have instances where he would make some quick draws. All right, so back to the game here. Uh, I play king to b1. And after king b1, king b8 is played, I go rook c1. Again, my idea is that I can always play knight f4, but there's no need to rush it, specifically because if black plays h5, I can always go knight to e5. And now black can never play f6 because the g6 pawn is weak. But if we go back to this position, and I try knight e5 right away, black can now just kick the pony with f6. So it's a very delicate situation, and I'm just keeping this move in reserve, so that if black ever plays h5 and loosens the structure, I will put the knight here, and there's never a pawn push. So after king b8, rook c1, knight e8 is played by Richard. Now again, I'm not sure if Richard knew of the, of the Smyslov game, but very clearly he goes for the same idea, putting the knight on d6 where it can go to e4 or c4. 
So I play knight f4, knight d6, and now I, I took a very long time and I played this a4 move. Now it's a very tough situation here considering it's a match format, best of two, because I could have been very solid here. One of the moves that I considered initially was rook g1 and after something like bishop c8, playing something like b3 and just sitting on the position. Again, I don't really think white is much better here. Black can play something like rook e8, maybe knight e4. It's pretty close to equal. Um, at any rate, during the game, I was saying, you know, I'm in the situation in the semifinals. I have the white piece. It's a pretty stable position. Why not take a chance and go for it? Try to create some imbalances rather than just being solid. So I choose to play a4. And after a4, knight dc4 was played by Richard. Now, this was a very surprising move to me. I used a long time on a4 because after this move, bishop c8, I really wasn't sure what was going on. Now, one line that I did see was something like knight e5. And if f6 is played here, I can sack my two knights for this rook in the corner and again this has shades of something that happens in the game later on but i saw this idea already here where i could sacrifice uh, a couple of minor pieces for a rook in the corner but after bishop c8 if i play knight e5 here now black can go g5 let's say i go knight h5 black can play f6 and kick the knight out so it's really not all that clear what's going on i think after after bishop c8 my initial idea was to play something like b3 and then hope to get an a5 in a move or two but i wasn't really so sure about it However, after using quite a bit of time, I was shocked to find, find that Richard played knight dc4 almost instantly, and I was even more confused because now I sank into deep thought because I assumed this was a mistake because of a5, which I played in the game. As I said, when I thought for about 15-20 minutes here, I was expecting bishop c8, maybe knight bc4, but not knight dc4 because I thought it was slightly inaccurate, and then Richard played it right away, and so I was very upset with myself, and this is one of the things that's very tough at the, at the upper echelons of chess, is that when you spend a lot of time calculating and your opponent blitzes out a move that you don't think is best, you feel like, well, why did I waste all this time um, thinking when they played a move that wasn't, wasn't correct? So now after quite a think, I decide to go a5 here. And this leads to a very forcing and very concrete variation. So here, queen b4 is played by Richard. He did not take the pawn. Now it's worth noting that after knight takes pawn, I can play queen c5, attacking the queen and the knight. Black has to trade. And after pawn takes knight d7 here, I think I was going to play knight d4 with the idea of b4, attacking the knight. There's also b4 here right away. Um, but I, I guess after knight c4, takes, takes, knight g5. I mean, white's probably a little bit better but it's not completely clear. Uh, but my idea was to go knight d4 here, and the idea is that this knight on a5 is very out of play. I can go b4. I'm putting a lot of pressure on this bishop on e6 as well, and I thought that I should be a little bit better here. Of course, as you guys can see from the bar, the computer is not impressed and thinks that black is totally fine. At any rate, uh, Richard did not like this, and understandably so. Instead, he plays queen b4, and now I cannot take the knight on b6 here, because if I do, there's knight a3, creating a nice fork of the king and the queen, and I cannot capture the knight because then my king would be captured on b1. So after queen b4, the only move to play is queen c3, and now Richard takes the pawn. Important that he does not trade the queens first and go for knight a5, because if he does it in this order, I actually play something completely different than in the game. I go b3, restricting this knight. Now it has no squares. It's stuck on the rim. And after like knight d7, I can go king b2 followed by rook a1. And this knight is very bad if you ever go like b6. Now c6 becomes a weak point as well, potentially with b4 later on. So it feels really, really sketchy for black. So, so Richard takes with the queen. So now after trades, now you'll notice that I can't go b3 because if I play b3, black takes. And if I go rook c3, black gets his knight back to d6 just in the nick of time. So after knight a5, I go knight g5. And this, by the way, I saw all of this uh, before I played a5. I had calculated this exact line, rook df8. And now I play sort of a shocking move. I go bishop takes g6. Now it's worth noting, actually, when I was thinking about a5, I did consider a move like knight, knight to e5 or knight to d2 here. But again, I felt that after something like knight e5, knight c4, for example, it's just not very exciting. What happens is we trade, uh, we, we basically, well, let's say knight d2 because it's a safer one. We, we trade off everything here, something like this, 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 this. And again, we reach a rook and pawn endgame. Should be a draw. So I, I actually, when I calculate a5, I was very happy that I saw this idea with bishop takes g6. So it leads to a big imbalance here, and now it's anyone's game. So after I play this move bishop g6, the idea is that if I try to get the same thing with taking first, uh, first of all, if I take e6, f2 hangs. And if I take here, now black can sack the rook on f4. And after h6, you'll notice that black has a pawn on the king side here. Whereas in the other variation, after takes, if black takes, we take and I take, now I just have three, I have two connected pawns that are rolling up the board, so it's a much better version. 
So when I played this move, I wasn't 100% sure if this was good, but I figured, you know, I have to try to do something with white. Additionally, throughout my career, there have been numerous times where I've misevaluated positions of two minor pieces against a rook. And I almost always think that a bishop and a knight or two knights are better than a rook. So I figured, you know what, if normally I'm wrong and the computer disagrees with me, I might as well try to experiment and, and try to prove that I understand something about chess. Uh, or at least about a rook versus two minor pieces. Now, as it turns out, the computer, as you can see from the bar, says it's fine. Um, and now he plays knight b3 again. h takes g6, I don't think is great, because after takes, takes knight g6, forking the rooks. Black has to play a move like knight c4. Now I take, and I go something like h4, rook g1. I'm going to have two rooks behind two connected pass pawns, which are just running up the board really, really fast here. So I don't know what the objective evaluation of this is, but I felt that if anything, it has to be easier for white to play, because I really only have one plan. Put the rooks behind the two pawns and push the pawns, and that's it. Whereas black has to come with some kind of setup with the two knights to try and blockade. It's really not so easy, and because of that, I figured, well, you know, why not? Just go for it. So Richard actually decides to play knight b3, declines this this um, this offer to take the bishop. Now it's worth noting that this is also an important moment. If I play something like rook uh, d1, which looks like a natural move, this actually loses by force because after pawn takes, knight takes bishop, pawn takes knight g6. Now black can go rook takes f2, and after knight h8, there's a crushing move knight to c4, followed by rook b2 checkmate, and I just lose the game here. There's no way to stop checkmate. So it's a very critical moment. And this is where I use a lot of time to try and calculate a line. Now, there are many ways of playing this. Rook c2, for example, is playable, but I felt that after pawn takes, knight takes, pawn takes, knight takes. Now, after knight c4, I felt, or actually not knight c4, sorry, a5, a4, knight c4. I wasn't so sure what's going on. Again, probably h4, I take a rook and it should be very good. But I figured with the knight on b3, maybe some jump to like d2 or e4, I wasn't so sure about it. And therefore, I chose to play this move, knight takes e6 instead pawn takes knight h7 now again you'll see the computer is not a huge fan of this but it's actually quite easy to play for white so you don't always have to find the absolute best line if you can find a line that's playable where it's very easy for you so after knight takes h7 rook g8 is played i go bishop d3 takes takes now you might think well black's up an exchange here he's up a rook for a knight and a pawn but it's very dangerous because of the pawn structure here essentially what i have is i, I have two connected pass pawns but additionally i have an f pawn to support it as well so just one example of how dangerous this can become is after rook g7 knight f6 let's say black plays knight d7 here i can now trade and after i play this move h4 rook g7 bishop e2 this is close to winning for white because i'm going to be able to create a connect four here let's say king c7 i go f4 king d6 g5 and you can already see that the connect four is coming with e3 f4 g5 and h6 and two moves again bishop also controls h5 so because of the imbalance in the pawn structure and the fact that i have the two connected but also i have an f2 pawn that can go to f4 it's really really tricky to play for black here and in this position, Richard played what I thought was actually a great try. I completely overlooked it, um, which is he goes rook f7, g5, and now he takes. Now, it's worth noting rook h4 is also a move. But again, after f4, I've got this connect 3. And long term, I can probably even run my king over to g3 and just start running the h and the g pawns up the board. So it feels very hard to play. Computer probably can salvage it for black. But from a human standpoint, very difficult. It was very little time. It's, again, going to be hard to play, especially because white just has to come up with one or two plans, either run the king to the king side or find a way to push the g-pawn through, and it'll be very easy to play. Whereas for Richard, it's going to be extremely hard, limited time, very easy to make a blunder. So instead, Richard takes, which I was actually very unhappy when I saw this because I thought already I was better and I was going to be able to put a lot of pressure on him. And then I realized we're, it's kind of petering out onto an end game. Now, I felt that I was still better here, but I wasn't convinced it was winning. So I go h4, he takes, I go h5 goes rook h6 only move if you don't play if you don't stop the pawn knight d7 h6 is just gg rook h8 h7 rook h8 rook g1 rook g7 or rook g8 again very passive rook and it's completely winning for white so here rook h6 is played and now i now i come up with a very simple plan it's worth noting here that i can't do anything in the center i go something like e4 black can always take and just run the king all the way over there aren't really weaknesses black's pawn structure is very stable i only have an outside pawn so i can't really play against the pawn structure so what is the weakness or what is the one advantage i have here again if i had a g pawn i could run it up and just win the game but with an f pawn let's say f4 and f5 again it's just a trade of pawns it doesn't really change anything so therefore i have to look for a concept and the one advantage i have here is a pass pawn, a rook behind it, and this black rook on h6. So now I come up with a very straightforward plan. 
try to get the king over the king side and escort the h pawn up the board it's worth noting if i go bishop g6 for example at the very worst black can put a knight on f6 and again nothing is really happening here uh, i can't really do much in the center of the board i can't do anything on the king side so that's why i choose to go for this king walk with king d2 king c7 king e2 king b6 king f3 all of this is forced by the way pretty much king e7 king g4 again if black plays knight d7 now i go king g5 attacking the rook and now the pawn starts rolling and this should be winning so after king g4 richard goes king f6 to stop my king from getting in but now i play rook to h3 doing a rook lift trying to bring the rook over get rid of the king and trying to use this open file so now richard plays knight c8 i check king g7 bishop g6 guarding the pawn also trying to infiltrate with rook f7 here knight d6 is played and now this is where i played a move that after i played the move i was very upset with myself especially um especially because it, it was time control and so i had a while to think after this move uh, i i thought that initially rook f4 was a better try and after a5 i could go f3 and the point is that let's say black goes b5 here i go king g5 something like b4 and now i have rook to f6 and i'm gonna win the pawn on e6 and this is completely winning i wasn't so sure what was going on here after like rook g6 takes and king g6 but again i had a feeling during the game that this probably should be winning or i felt that it was winning computer actually disagrees by the way now that i let it get depth so apparently my intuition was better than uh, or my intuitive feel with king g5 was better than what i started thinking about after a minute or two um when i got it from the board since it was move 40. Uh, so instead i go king g5 and the reason i was mad at myself was because after a5 i have to play rook f4 worth noting rook f6 here doesn't work because there's a very nasty tactic where black can play rook h5 and if i take with the king he takes my rook and if i take with the bishop he goes knight e4 forking the king and the rook so after a5 i played rook f4 and you think on first glance well yeah because if b5 you go f3 and rook f6 like you just alluded to in the video but as i realized when i got it from the board on move 40 after rook f4 here black can play knight e4 and now after bishop takes pawn takes rook e4 in my in my initial thoughts when i was thinking for like three to four minutes before playing king g5 i just thought this was winning um but then when i got it from the board and and richard was thinking on his 40th move which was a5 i realized to my horror that there was this line with rook f6 f4 rook f5 king g4 and rook b5 initially i missed this i just thought that after f4 the only line i saw was b5 rook e5 and i thought well if a4 e4 is just winning and if black tries rook f5 here it's classic you're in the box here in that game you can trade takes b4 king e4 a4 king d3 a3 takes takes king c2 king b1 or b2 and you're just winning the king upon end game um but then as i said i realized when richard was thinking that he has this annoying move rook to b5 and the reason i say this is really annoying is because now i realize that after takes a4 uh, I, I do a little bit of a tickle here that we get to this starting position and black has two connected pawns that are running away on the queen side and it's not really clear how I'm winning I have two connected here but they're a lot slower potentially getting up the board because the black king can get over my king of course is nowhere near the queen side here so black's king can maybe stop some of these pawns that are rolling up the board so here I decide to play e4 now it's worth noting I never really felt that I was in danger but I knew that I was going to be have to be very very precise to win this because again black has an easy idea just get these two pawns up the board and I'm gonna to have to find a way to use the wide peoples to win the game and split the pawns so now Richard plays rook a2 rook b3 was another move that I considered but I felt that after rook b3 e5 a3 this had to be winning so I can go f5 b4 and now after f6 if king goes to h7 i go f7 if king f7 now i go h6 and again it's a complete disaster if king g6 h7 takes and f7 wins and there's just no stopping the peoples even though they're really close here so instead richard plays rook a2 which is a logical move guards the pawn and now his pawn has a straight path to b1 it's just uno dos tres cuatro game over so now i play rook a7 king h6 and we do a little bit of a tickle tickle with rook a6 king h7 now it's worth noting if black tries to push the pawn and ignore it you do not take the pawn here very important if you take the pawn after king h7 white has nothing better than to force a draw because now after rook b6 b3 suddenly these pawns are really really fast going up the board there's like b2 and a3 and i don't know the computer maybe says it's still better but you can't allow this but the point is that after b4 you can actually go pawn to d5 here and you have the pin and now after b3 you take with the pawn and now you're going to actually push this pawn up the board black has to do something like king h7 but after c7 rook c2 rook a4 rook c7 rook b4 white is just very simply winning so i play rook a6 he goes king h7 now i did this primarily because at this point we're both down to about 10 maybe 11 minutes left at this point in the game and i just want to gain an extra 30 seconds very quickly so now i, I do the tickle tickle and i go e5 here 
And now b4, of course, only move. I go e6 here. Again, king is one square too far away, so this is very, very dangerous. And it was here that that um, Richard really surprised me. He played this move b3, and in my mind, when I was calculating these repetitions and even e5, I was always looking at black pushing this pawn to a3, and after f5, this should just be very easily winning for white. But then Richard pushed his pawn to b3, and it really confused me, because when he did this, I think I had about 10 minutes, and I used him in like 6 or 7 minutes here, because I was expecting the other pawn push, and I suddenly realized that after b3, I have to be very careful here, because if I, if I play something like rook to b6, for example, black can go rook to e2, and now after f5, b2, suddenly black's getting a3, a2, and b1 in, and again, computer still gives white an advantage, but I, I realized that there's real danger that I could actually lose this position as well. So I use a long time here, and finally I play king to f5. And the idea that I realized after going king f5 is very simple. If black pushes the pawn to b2 here, after rook b6, the rook is on the wrong side of the pawn. So, for example, if black could have this position, for example, black is completely fine. The rook is very active. Actually, let me put the rook on e2 for illustrative purposes. Rook stops the pawn, and now the a pawn is going down the board. Very easy to play. But, but in this case, after rook b6, the rook is caught on the wrong side of the pawn. So now you can never move the rooks I take. And after a3, I just go e7. Rook stops the queen and now stops the pawn from queening. And I push my pawn, make a queen, game over. So b2 isn't playable. And therefore, it's very tricky because a3 also isn't playable because now I go e7, rook e2, rook a3, rook e7, rook b3. And this is also winning. White has two extra pawns. So after king f5, black can't push the pawn. Also, you can't move the rook to the center because now I take this one. So you're kind of stuck here. You can't push the b pawn, can't push the a pawn, can't move the rook. So now I have time to bring my king up and start pushing the pawns. And I think after this move, it's pretty cleanly winning. This was really the last critical moment where I defined something. Um, and even though I was getting a little bit low on time, I think I used like seven or eight minutes, I still found this move with three minutes to spare. So after king f5 is played, we have rook to a1. And now I go rook to b6. Another very important move, by the way. I can maybe go e7, but I have to be very careful because there is one problem with this endgame. After rook e1, rook a4, rook e7, if I play a move like rook to b4 here, black can go rook to e3. And the problem with this endgame is that we're getting very close. Let's say rook b6 here, rook, rook c3. We're getting very close to an endgame, which is a theoretical draw. Let's say I go king g5 if black goes rook to g3 and rook c3. Uh, it's a draw. Let's say I go king g4 here, for example. After rook to d3, rook takes c6, rook d4, rook b6. Black doesn't even need the b pawn here. After playing a move like rook d1, rook takes b3 and king to h6. This is a theoretical draw, even though white has two extra pawns here, because of the classic split f and h pawns here. So this is actually a draw. Um, and so I had to keep this in mind, even here at this point in the game, that I can't really allow one of these end games where I'm up two pawns, but it's the f4 and h5 pawns. So after rook a1, I go rook to b6, another excellent move if I, might, if I might say so myself. I stop the pawns from moving. If a3, I just take. You can't push because I take. So the pawns get glued on b3 and a4. And after rook to b6 here, rook e1 is played. And now I go king f6. And this is a really critical, critical moment because I calculated and realized that if black pushes a3, I actually sack the rook. I take a2, rook a3, queen takes, takes e7. And if black goes rook e1, I go king f7. And if king h6, I'd make a queen, takes, takes, king d7, king g4, king c6, king f4, d5, king e5, d6, king e6, d7, king e7, king c7, I make a queen and end the game here. And additionally, if uh, if black tries from the side to go like rook a8 here, again, king f7, rook a7, king f8, and I make a queen again and win this way as well. So after king f6, rook to e4 is played here, and now I play this move e7. Now again, this is good enough to win. But probably cleaner would have been to play f5. And after rook takes d4, I can go e7, rook to e4. And I believe king f7, c5, queen takes, takes c4, f6, uh, c3, f7, c2, f8, queen, c1, queen. Not rook h6 because you can capture, but just rook b7, queen c7, rook c7 is mate. Now, this I probably should have seen, but the thing is, in my mind already, I was a little bit low on time. And I thought that e7 was a very clean win by force. Now, it is winning. But it is a little bit tricky because in the game after rook f4, king e5, rook f1, king d6, not queen by the way, because then check wins the queen, king d6, rook e1. I thought after king d7, it's game over and I'm winning on the spot, but Richard has one last resource. Now, if black plays something like king to g7, I make a queen, takes, and again, the pawns are glued. If you push, I take. If you push, I take. And now after king f6, just rook b4, and I eat one of the pawns, and that's that's all she wrote. But Richard does have c5 here. And now the problem is that it's still winning, but it's tricky. So initially I wanted to play d5, 
Um, but now black at c4 and the pawns are rolling. Now, mind you, this is still winning. So after takes c3 here, d6, c2, d7, c1, d8, you're still winning in the position because black can't really push the pawns up the board. Uh, I guess if queen e3, you can play queen e7 check. And after takes, same thing, rook b4, capture one of the pawns. I probably should have played this because I, I realized this was winning. But then I thought, you know what? I can also just take the pawn and this has to be winning somehow. But after rook d1, it gets tricky. And the reason it gets tricky here is my initial idea was to go king e8, rook e1, king f7, rook f1, rook f6. And I thought, okay, well, black trades, b2, queen, queen, check, trade. And if, if king g8, I go c6, a3, c7, a2, c8, I win by one tempo. And if black goes king h6, g7, king h7, king f7, also it's just winning. But as I realized much my horror after rook f6, there's still rook e1 here. And now it gets very tricky because now if I go rook b6, black checks again. And if I queen, I actually lose the game because after takes, black can go b2, rook b6, a3. And suddenly the black pawn is going to a2. There's b1, a1. And I mean, I guess computer says it's still a draw, but it's an absolute catastrophe anyway, any way you, uh, any way you shake it out. So therefore, I realized my horror that suddenly it's quite tricky. But luckily, I kept my wits about me. And I found another transition into a winning rook and pawn endgame. So I go king c7. Rook e1, king d6, check. Of course, if black plays a move like king g7 here, now I can use the wide peepos. I go h6. If king h6, I make a queen, takes, and I create the discovered check. And this is, of course, winning because the pawns are still glued. And if after check, I go king c6, rook e1, and now I found rook b4. The last really critical move here, transitioning into a rook and pawn endgame, which is just winning. Of course, if black plays a3, I take a2, rook a3, and now if queen takes, if rook e1, I make a queen. And so that doesn't work. And after after b2, I guess black can also take here, but after rook a4, as long as black can't get the rook behind the pawn, this wins, say rook e3. Actually, let's say b2, rook b4, rook e2. I can just very simply go king b7. Rook is always attacking the pawn, and after rook c2, c6, you'll notice that the rook always stops the pawn, and now my king is just going to escort this c6 pawn all the way up the board, and I will win. Black will have to give up the rook for the pawn. So instead, Richard plays b2, I take, rook e7, and now just rook a2. If black goes rook e4, just king b5, king h6, rook a4. Black goes rook e8, for example, I can even just go rook g4, king h5, rook g1. King is completely cut off, way too far away, and this just is a very easy winning rook and pawn endgame. And if black tries like rook a7, I go king b6, rook a8, and now just c6 followed by king b7, c7, c8. Very easy winning rook and pawn endgame as well. So therefore, in this position after rook a2, uh, rook a2, Richard resigns, and I get the first win in this mini match. Again, it's a two game match, so if I don't lose tomorrow, I will move on to the final. If I do lose, we will have tie breaks, but at any rate, it's a great start. I win this very tough game in the Queen's Gamp decline. I hope you all have enjoyed this video. I know it's a pretty long recap. I'm obviously quite tired because this game was almost six hours, but it's what it is. We move on, we take the dub. And again, if you guys haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button right below. Have a good one, everybody. See you tomorrow. <laughs>